MGF of a continuous uniform between A and B. Okay, X is a random variable that is uniform. Continuous uniform distribution, so we know that we have to integrate, not sum, because it's continuous. times the PDF which is 1 over B minus A DX and it's over the interval of A to B for uniform. Okay so this looks pretty simple isn't it? So the constant comes out, the constants which are the ones which things which do not depend on the thing that we're integrating which is X. B over A E to the TX DX. Here we're assuming that A and B are finite numbers. Also assuming that obviously a is not equal to b, otherwise you divide by zero. But if you have a equals to b, you've got nothing really. Okay, one over b minus a, and this is straightforward integral of this guy here. Um, as um, quick revision, remember that when we integrate something of the form a to the x dx, it's going to equal two one over a e to the x plus some kind of constant of integration. Check your answer just if, if you're not sure that this is, oops, a to the x there, sorry. Let's just clear on that. e to the a x, yeah, plus constant. So if we differentiate this guy, I should get back this. So I do, if I differentiate this guy, it's going to be, um, take uh, this down here, differentiate respect to x I get a, so that a over a cancels and then get this again, okay, and the derivative of constant is zero of course, so so this is uh, fine. That's what I'm going to use here. I have then dot 1 over t, because that's going to be 1 over t there, and I bring it out of the, here because it's not, doesn't, um, doesn't depend on x I'm going to calculate this thing with respect to x here, replacing x with b and a. Okay, so you can kind of see it. It's not hard, this. There. Um, so is that it? The answer is no, because, I mean, this looks really, it is simple up to here. Um, but look at this. If t is zero, what happens? Well, e to the t to the b, b is finite number, t is zero, so it's going to be e to the zero, which is one. That's the same thing, so it's zero. Over, and then this thing's finite times t, which is zero. So what we're left with in the uh, case at t is zero is zero over zero, um, which is what they call an indeterminate form. So what we can say for this for sure is that it's okay so long as for t not equal to zero. And this shows you that when calculating MGFs we look out for cases when the thing exists. All right. So this is going to make sense if t is not equal to zero. So look at the case when t is zero. What can we say? Can we say anything at all? Case at t is zero, we have that then the m0, MGF of zero looks to be 0 over 0 from what I just said up here, which is what they call an, let's do this letter, indeterminate, which is indeterminate, what is 0 over 0. Okay, and this is where people who've done real analysis have an edge over people who have not done real analysis. 0 over 0, hmm. Well, I'm going to show you that this is actually equal to 1. It's not always equal to 1. It basically depends on the rate at which the top and bottom approach 0. And now there's two ways to solve this. The good thing about proofs is that you can see various techniques you wouldn't otherwise see being used. So let's say I'm going to give you method 1 here and method 2. Right, first method I'm going to show you um, is using a Taylor expansion of the top term, this guy in the numerator. Just recall that 
e to the x, but you use a tail expansion of e to the x, it's going to be 1. So I'm sure you've seen this at high school, plus x, plus x squared over 2, plus x cubed over 3 factorial, and so on. All right. So using that, we can see that these two guys, instead of having x, just substitute in tb for this expression, likewise for that guy. So if I can let you do that, what I'm going to see, I'll just write down what the difference is. You can see that this is going to be equal to, let's see, tb minus ta is going to be the first term, because I'm just grouping terms at the same time, plus a half, and what we're going to have, big brackets here, tb all squared, minus ta all squared, plus, and so on. And, I d and um, you'll see in a moment why I don't have to continue to write this. Therefore, 1 over t, I'm looking at this bit here, is going to be e, oops, tb minus e to ta, divide the whole thing by t, you can see here straight away that goes to the b over a, because there's a common factor of t that comes out. Likewise, in this square bracket, it's a common factor of t squared that comes out. And that's going to cancel one of the t, so you're going to have t over 2 times b squared minus a squared. And you can see that if I, if I did include more higher all the terms, I'm going to have t's in all of them. So, why don't I bother? Well, because you can see that what I'm trying to do is I'm kind of wanting to calculate I should have said this at the start, so I apologize for not doing that. What I want to do is I want to look at what happens in the limit. So let's write it m to the t, what does that tend to as t tends to zero? That is the question. Another way of writing that using different notation is what's the limit as t tends to 0 of m to the t. Okay, you can use either expression. So this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking at a limit of this mgf as t tends to 0. So now I can see that, having written this down, I can see that the limit, so the limit as t tends to 0 of this function is 1 over b minus a times the limit, because this thing doesn't depend on t, it can come out of the limit sign, that is a rule, of the limit of and this, of um, 1 over t, I this thing, e to the tb minus e to the ta. But we can see from here that as t tends to a 0, can you see that that second term is obviously going to go to 0. All the terms have t in the numerator all tend to 0. In other words, this tends to just b over a. So this is equal to 1 over b dot a dot b minus a, which cancel, hence 1. Hence we can conclude that the MGF takes the value 1 at t is 0. That's method 1, using the Taylor expansion. OK, the second method is way more beautiful, and uh, I'm going to show you now, and um, just much more easier to work with, as you'll see when it comes to calculating moments. Uh, this method, uh, less than 2% of my students have seen this in high school. Uh, I recall from last year, one, one guy who'd seen it and he was from Singapore. So let's have a look. Um, MGF, right, the method here is when we have something, this is basically a course in real analysis. Well, this bit is from a course in real analysis. Anything of the form 0, 0, or infinity over infinity, these are what are called indeterminate forms but they can take values because when we have such things it's really asking us what's the rate at which the things go to zero or infinity and then there's something that's really useful when we're looking for um, the limits of something that's zero over zero or infinity over infinity and that is called uh, L'Hopital's rule 
L'Hôpital's rule. Some people have an S there. Like hospital. L'Hôpital. Uh, I think in the French spelling, it's a French guy. I think that he has an S in there. Okay, L'Hôpital's rule. And all that says is that as limit of x tends to a of x a of a function f of x, g of x, is equal to the limit of x of a of the derivative of x with respect to x, derivative of g with respect to x. And we'll apply this multiple times, so I could continue, I could call limit of x to the a um, second derivative of x, g x, and so on. All right, let's see how we're going to use it here. Um, just to recap then, uh, that's what we want, it's a fantastic result. Okay, uh, let's see, so we have the mgf, just write this down 